So Kickstarter is a platform for funding creative projects. Um, it's music, it's film, it's art, it's photography, it's food, it's technology. Um, pretty much the only thing we don't allow are charities or causes. So you can't raise money uh, for the Red Cross or to buy Jenny a prom dress. Um, we specifically created Kickstarter to be a place for creativity. You know, fundraising is traditionally associated with Jerry Lewis and bake sales and has that sort of, you could call it a stigma, but that sort of feel to it. Uh, and we just thought that creativity deserved its own space. So that's one important thing to know. Um, all the products on the site uh, also have an interesting little twist, which is that all the funding is all or nothing. So on Kickstarter, you set a fundraising goal. In the case of this project, it's $25,000 and you need to set a deadline by which to reach it. Now, if this project meets or exceeds its goal by its deadline and has 23 days to raise the remaining $13,000, then at that point, all the backers are charged at once. The person, the creator here, gets their money and they go and do their thing. If they come up even a dollar short, it's $24,999. No one is ever charged and no money changes hands at all. Um, I think at first blush, this sounds scary and maybe a little draconian, uh, but in actuality, this will really drive a lot of money your way. Um, people like the safety in numbers of knowing they're only charged if everyone else is getting charged too. I think it makes people feel more comfortable that, you know, this is a fully funded project, that you're not buying someone a pack of Marlboro Lights or something, because that's the only $15 they got. Um, so I think that will really serve you well. And the interesting stat that we have is that to raise your goal, uh, once products reach 30% of their funding goal, they succeed around 95% of the time. So for most projects, it's just about that start. You're pushing the boat you know, off the dock, and then momentum will carry it through. So in the case of this project, it went up about a week ago. It's raised $12,000 in its first week. Uh, I would bet anything that it will make its goal, and then it will make it you know, handily. Um, here's some basic stats about what we've done on Kickstarter. Um, so the amount of money that's going through there is remarkable, and especially when you consider that the most famous person to ever use Kickstarter could be one of you the second you launch your project. Um, it's really a site made up of people you know, just like us, just people who are making art, trying to produce things, reaching out to their friends, their network, uh, and it's just a very self-sustaining model in that kind of way. Um, and in terms of how we keep the lights on, uh, if you successfully raise your goal, we will take 5% of what you raised as our fee. Um, that's our only fee. There are additional fees that Amazon will apply for credit card processing, which is about 3% of what you raise, 3 to 4%, depending on a few factors. Uh, but our fee is 5%. Um, and through that, we're actually a profitable, sustainable company, so you don't have to worry about us going away. Um, so I want to talk about a few things today. Uh, I want to talk about the things that you should do to have a greater likelihood of success, the mistakes to not make, uh, and then what happens after the fact. So when you think about the things that really drive a project, there are really three pieces that are very important. And the first of which is having a video. Um, this should be easy for everyone here. Uh, if you're a musician or a photographer, maybe it's a little more awkward. Um, but having a video is really important. 80% of our projects have a video. We are a video-driven site, by and large. Um, you know, your first instinct might be, I will put up my trailer and just let that roll and cool, the money will come in. But in actuality, people want to see you. Uh, people fund projects just as much because of who the person is that's making it as it is what it is that they're doing. You know, they want to back something because someone seems nice or because they're cute or because they could tell they're good at what they do. Uh, and so putting yourself out there is a really important part of it. There are clever ways to do it if you feel uncomfortable with it. Um, there's a, a really interesting medium that's developed on Kickstarter of like the anti-commercial, where people will include like all the false starts and will try to show their awkwardness because they feel uncomfortable selling themselves, and that's something I am incredibly uh, empathic towards. And so you know, there's, an inter there's all kinds of ways to approach it. There's no wrong way. Um, but really putting yourself in it, telling your story is really important. And, and just to show you a great example, um, I want to show a video for what we think is the best uh, project video we've seen so far. Um, this is not the bar that you have to reach, but I think it will give you a good sense. It's by a woman named Jocelyn Town for a film called I Am I. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Town, and I am the writer and director of I Am I. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the project, how it came to be, and why we're raising funds on Kickstarter. So, I started writing the script about five years ago with my writing partner Hans, a parrot, but his scenes were kind of one newt. Hello. 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 He was really big on hellos, and to be fair, all the hellos in the script are his. Unfortunately, Hans couldn't be with us this evening because he is now living in Las Vegas with a wonderfully talented cross-dressing Cuban Judy Garland impersonator, but that's a completely different story. 
So anyway, when I finished writing the script, I decided to show it to my friend Mariana. Hey, Mariana. Hi, Jocelyn. Would you read my script? Love to. Thank you. Wow, this is brilliant. That was a quick read. I'd love to show my producers. Oh. They're here somewhere. Hi, I'm Jocelyn. I'm Cora. Nice to meet you. Hey, Jen. Hi. Cora and Jen and Mariana all worked on Mariana's movie, Good Dick, together. So after I showed it to Mariana, I thought I should ask my friend Erin if she would be my production designer on the movie. Unfortunately, Erin couldn't be with us this evening either because she is working on a project in Paris. Bonjour, Erin. And I asked her, Erin, est-ce que tu voudrais travailler sur mon film avec moi? And she said, oui. So then she pulled all of these great images and with them we were able to make a lookbook for the film. So after that happened, I figured I should ask some actors if they wanted to be in the movie. And I realized I'm married to a pretty great actor. Hey, Simon. <laughs> Would you like to play Seth in the movie? Do I have time to towel off? Of course you do. Then yes, thank you for asking. Brilliant. So that was pretty great. And then after that, I was standing right here when I called Jason up and I said, Hey, Jason, would you like to play Jonathan in the movie? Uh, yes, I would. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be really great in that. Uh, it's a great part. I'm very excited to do it. Me too. So that happened. It did. It did. And then after that, bye, Jason. Uh, after that, uh, we decided to design a website for the movie. And on it, we're doing interviews where I sit down every couple of weeks with a different filmmaker and talk to them about their experience making their first movie. So they share advice and stories from all of their experiences. You should check it out at imithefilm.com. Then I talked to my friend Nick and I said, Nick, would you design a poster for me? Yeah, it's right there. That's awesome. That's great. So Nick did that, and now we're ready to start making our movie. So we're trying to raise funds on Kickstarter through friends and family and new supporters so that we can actually begin the production this summer. As I was getting into bed one night, I asked Simon, I don't know how to talk about this on Kickstarter. One night, you asked? No, many. Not every night, actually. She asked me a lot over... Over. Well, asking people to give money is like asking them to get in bed with you, and that's kind of weird if you don't know them. Right. Yeah. Mariana? Yeah? Hey. Hi. Would you like to get in bed with us? Definitely. Wait, what are you... <laughs> Yee! <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this isn't that weird because we actually know her. <laughs> hey, you guys, would you like to get in bed too? Yeah! Yeah. We all know each other, so this isn't that weird. Hi, you guys. Oh, but this is someone I don't know. Hi, I'm Jocelyn. Hi, I'm Kendra. Would you like to get in bed with us? Oh, yeah, I am. Oh, would you like to get in bed with us? I'm Jocelyn. Yeah. Come on. Hey, hi, Teddy. Nice hi. to meet you. I'm Jocelyn. Hi, hi. Come on in. Hi, Oh, yeah. I have a question. Isn't this a little like the Constitution? I mean, people are paying to get in bed with us. No, but this is a metaphor. But now it feels pretty real to me. I mean, someone is uh, crushing my privates in reality. <laughs> But this is, it's still a concept. This is a conceptual bed. And we would like you to get into our conceptual bed with us. Yeah. <laughs> so they were trying to raise $100,000. And you could see there that they raised $112,000. Wow. Um, I would wager at least half that money became, came because of that video. You know, that communicated so much. And this is a film that's just in development. She has a script uh, and a crew. And, you know, she, you see exactly what she has in that. Um, but she produced it and put it together in such a compelling way that it said a lot about what it is that she's trying to do. Uh, the other thing that matters is the rewards. So Kickstarter is not a straight donation platform. Uh, it's not a tip jar. You have to give someone back um, something in exchange. So if I have a $10, if you give me $10, you get $10 of something in return. And as a project creator, you get to define what that is. Um, the one thing we don't allow is any sort of uh, equity or financial return of any kind. That is strictly forbidden, so no one can get points on your film, no one can get anything like that. Um, no one can get back their money plus a certain percentage. Uh, it's all goods, products, and services. And so there are three big buckets to think about when you think about rewards. Um, the first of which is you just give a copy of the thing that you're making. Um, this is the most common thing by far. You're, making, you're writing a book, you're making a record, you get a copy of the record or the book when it's done. Um, it's really important to price these things, what they would cost in a retail environment. Uh, you don't want the PBS $100 tote bag that just is not going to fly. 
Um, you know, we have, we have a problem on this site. We used to, uh, much more than we do now, but of like the $100 DVD. Someone putting up their film and being like, get a copy of the DVD for 100 bucks. I think it's a backward way to think about it, to ask your most fervent supporters to overpay to support you. Um, so just pricing those things what people would expect is, is definitely the right way to go. Um, the other thing is that you can use your rewards to tell your story. Um, so there's lots of really great examples of this. You know, when I back a project, it's not just that I want to see the thing happen. I want to, I want to feel like I'm a part of it. Um, a really good exa example is there's a woman from here in LA who uh, <coughs> is sailing around the world. She raised money to sail around the world alone, a solo circumnavigation of the globe. And one of her rewards was for $15, you get a Polaroid that she took on her trip and that she would mail it to you the next time she got into port. And that's something that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an artifact. It tells a lot about the story. It makes an emotional connection. It's a very simple thing to do. So little things like that, they can just be gestures, are very meaningful. And of course, along with this are things like on-screen credit and stuff like that. And you see a lot of that. Uh, we see a lot of, you know, the director will come and do a screening with you. We'll name a character after you in our graphic novel. Uh, you can do those things if you want. You're by no means obligated to. You know, the, your art is the most important thing here. Uh, this shouldn't infringe on it. This shouldn't push you in a direction that you're uncomfortable with. But these are things that tend to do well. And they do well because, A, because you could price them at a higher amount. So the rewards on Kickstarter could be anywhere from a dollar to $10,000. And believe it or not, we probably have about six or seven $10,000 pledges a day. Like, those things sell. And so, you know, having something there that's crazy um, really works. So in the case of that, that project I showed you before, Dash Shaw uh, making this animated feature, one of the rewards, I don't remember if it was 10000 maybe a little less, is for John Cameron Mitchell, who's the producer on the film, to do a screening with you, like dinner and a movie, basically, with John Cameron Mitchell. I'm sure that someone will buy that by the time it's done. Um, so thinking about things like that that you can offer, again, that you feel comfortable with, that don't, you know, mess with, with your personality or, or your work, I think are a good way to think about things. Because um, really what you want people to think is that your project is their project. You know, that emotional connection is, is really important. Uh, and when I give someone five bucks, like, I, I feel like I have some, I have investment in that. Not in any literal way, but emotionally I do. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, and the third reason why projects succeed is that they have strong communities. So unfortunately, the internet is not a magical place where you can put up a project and the money just comes to you. Um, you have to work for it. And, you know, a lot of the money is going to come from relationships that you already have. So when you think about where money comes from, uh, there are a few different ways to think about it. Uh, the first are just, you know, the, your, your network, your close network of your, of your fans, of your audience, of the people that you know, of your peers. Um, they are going to form the bulk of your support. Uh, for most projects, you see that the early money especially um, comes from those people. And the really clever thing that that IMI video got right is you notice that first she invited the people in her bed that she knew. And once they're all there, then she invited the other people in. There's a simple psychology that people come to a project that doesn't have a lot of money, and they're not so sure about it. But once it has 40%, 50%, whatever, there's that validation of, oh shit, this is for real. Like, I could be a part of this. So that initial money will really help a lot in sort of getting the project going and building that momentum. And if you see a project uh, you know, start to do well with that momentum, you'll see it start to break out into the rest of the internet. Um, at this point, Kickstarter has become a platform for just ideas that people come to to look at and see what they could be involved in. We get three million visitors a month, and they're all looking for just something cool, you know, something to, to, to latch on to. Um, and so having a project that really can inspire people, you know, it's just, it's, it's incredible what it's, what it's capable of doing. Um, and when you think about how you talk to people about the project, it's important to not just say, you know, I could really use 20 bucks right now. You want to say, uh, you know, I'm doing something cool, and it'd be a whole lot cooler if you were part of it. And having that sort of tact, and really talking to people very directly about that, and explaining, you know, why you do what you do. For, in most cases, people will probably be excited to do it. They'll say, I've heard you talk about your work for years. I've never been quite sure how to relate to it, how to, you know, how to be more involved. Giving you 50 bucks on the internet is a joy. It's my pleasure to do it. So I think you'll find you, there's a lot of that reaction. Um, so of course not every project succeeds. Uh, as I said, 55% 50 of projects do not meet their goal. Uh, and there's a few reasons why that happens. Um, the first one by far is that they don't tell anyone about what they're doing. So of those projects that fail, 40% never get a single dollar. So you should just forget those right, you know, right off the bat. If you can't get your mom to give you five bucks, like you don't deserve anything. <laughs> uh, and so you know, never telling anyone is the first mistake that, that things make. Um, so even if you just get a dollar, your chance of success are much greater than 50%. They're close to 60% if you get just a dollar. Uh, the other thing is being smart about how much to ask for. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Uh, but, 
you know, if you're just like, I could really use a million dollars right now, but in your head you can't logically see where that million dollars might come from, you know, that tells you something. So you want to think, you want to try to analyze what you think you can get. Um, that is a hard thing to do, obviously, and we can help with that. We have people who you could talk to who will help you strategize. Um, but that's, that's probably the toughest thing about this. Um, you know, the other things that, are, that, that really make a difference are things we've already talked about. Not having a video, overpricing your rewards. But the one that's really important is the profit, not passion. Um, some people approach projects and it just feels like someone's trying to extract as much money out of the internet as they can. And that is the exact wrong way to do this. You know, you want to talk about what it is that you're doing and who you are as an artist and why people should give a shit. Um, and, and you want to think about it not like a business proposal. That's the wrong way to think about this because you're, you're appealing to your peers. You know, if you think about trying to go raise money from a boardroom or, or whatever, they're thinking about very specific things uh, that they want to know, like what's the revenue, what's the commercial potential, all that sort of stuff. But if you think about us as audiences, like we don't actually care about any of those things. We just want to see something that's made pretty well. We like it to be made by people that we like. You know, those are really the things that drive us as audiences. So thinking about that when you're, when you're presenting your project is, is a good frame of reference. Um, so when it comes to structuring your project, uh, there are three big things to think about. The first is how much money you want to raise. Um, number one rule is that you can always raise more than your goal, but never less, right? Because there's the all or nothing funding system. So whatever you set as your goal, you should think of as sort of the floor of what you would need to at least do what you're promising to do. Um, it could be your, you know, your ideal version. It could be your, all right, this will at least get it out the door version of whatever that level is. That's up to you. Um, but picking, starting with that amount is, is smart. Um, there's interesting things around goals where you know, a project can raise more than its goal. And of the projects that do make it, uh, on average they raise 125% of what they're looking for. You know, when you think about where you set that floor, there is the instance where when you get to that level, people are like, great, you made it, congratulations. And in actuality, they might not see that this is just, this is a suggestion of what it is that you want to do. Um, and so, you know, typically what you see is that the projects that get way overfunded, and we have projects that are thousands of percent funded, uh, they tend to happen because people want a thing. They want a physical good that's being made. They're treating this as a pre-order mechanism. Um, so if you're writing a book that a lot of people want, people are going to continue to buy your book even if you've already raised the 5K you needed to, to publish it. Um, so that's really what drives the things that get grossly overfunded. Um, the other thing to think about is how long your project should last. So we allow projects to last from anywhere to one to 90 days. Um, I think your gut reaction will be, go for 90 days. More time equals more money, and that is uh, the exact opposite of the case. Um, more time means more procrastination, and people are just going to forget. Um, the shorter duration will actually drive a lot more activity, because people will have that initial rush of, oh, this is new, this is exciting, and then pretty soon they'll have the feeling of, oh, no, this is going away. So in every project, we see that the first five days and the last five days are by far the most important. You're going to see most of your activity right then when you first launch, as the people who can't wait to support you are like, hell yeah, I'm in. And then those last five days, you'll see all the people who put it off, forgot about it, or the people who see that you're just short and they've been sitting on the sidelines and they're ready to come in. So for every product's funding, it's sort of shaped like a U. You know, it starts off rising out. There's a trough during the middle as just it's going. There isn't that sense of urgency or newness to drive people. If you have press happening then or something like that, that will give it a bump. But then at the very end, you'll see the activity start to happen again. And this has been universal from the very beginning. And so what we found was that projects with a 30-day duration have the highest success rate on Kickstarter. Uh, it's like 55 to 60 percent, something like that. A 90-day project has a 30 percent success rate. It might be even lower than that. So, you know, having something that feels fresh, uh, that's active, that has a lot of activity around it, is, is the right way to go. Uh, and the final sort of thing to think about on this level is, is how to price your stuff. Um, you know, as I said before, the most important thing is you price things at, at what they would cost. But obviously some things don't have an actual material cost. You know, what's the value of a phone call or a thank you? Um, but in general, you know, good things to know. The most common pledge is 25 bucks. Average is 70 bucks. So, you know, consumer price point kind of things. Uh, and then having things that go up and down the scale is, is really smart. You know, we all have our broke friends who maybe don't have jobs right now who would love to throw you five bucks for something interesting along with, you know, the, the rich, benevolent uncles who would love to give 10 grand to something that they're excited about. So thinking about the range of your audience is, is a good way to do it. So you've done it. You've raised your money. You know, you're, you're off to the races. Uh, the project is not done, obviously. You actually have to do the thing. And you also have to fulfill two expectations from your backers. 
Um, one are the things that you promise them. So you have to produce the DVDs or the books or whatever, and you have to mail it to them. Bless you. Uh, and you know you have to fa you want to factor those costs into what they charge and what you charge. Um, right now we don't have an easy option for adding shipping. We will have that uh, in the future. Um, but so right now you know adding an extra five bucks to cover that cost is a smart thing to do. Um, and the other thing that is equally important is fulfilling that experience. So the worst thing to happen is I raise my money, I post an update, and every every project has a specific blog and every time you post on that blog it gets emailed to everyone who's given you money right to their inbox you know you're reaching them and so once you raise your money you're like success you post how excited you are how thankful you are and then you just don't say anything else for six months that is the worst thing to do once you're actually making the thing like that's the moment where you can start to get people involved in process uh, you could just share a diary about what's going on you can post video you could do whatever you want uh, you know if you're in the middle of shooting and things are crazy and you don't have time that's totally cool. People understand that. Just maybe let them know beforehand. Um, you know, if you think about products that go awry, uh, I like to reference uh, Terry Gilliam making Don Quixote, where obviously everything went to shit. Uh, but fortunately, someone turned a camera on and made it into Lost in La Mancha, which is probably far more entertaining than Don Quixote would have ever been. Uh, but you know, if I backed Don Quixote on Kickstarter and what I got was Lost in La Mancha for my 20 bucks, like I'm cool with that. That's great. <laughs> you know, I got I got six months of entertainment out of that. I, I wish it turned out better, but you know. So thinking about that and being open in that kind of way, being open about you know your successes, your failures, all of that, I think is is really good. Like these are people who.